Let's just do a quick recap of where we were yesterday. And take a look at this derivation analysis of various tables. There was one column that I will not speak about. It was played in today's class. And that third column, the degrees of freedom. So just a quick explanation on that. Recall we've got these regression sum of squares. We've got the residual sum of squares. And we have the total sum of squares. And we said last time we did go to two cases. The one case where we did the data perfectly, and then the data case where the basis model we could fit was simply a model that was totally so let me just take a look at what those two things occur again. Uh, so this is a perfect model. And this is the worst case model. And you said last time for the perfect model that this will be some large number, this will be zero. And because the TSS is the sum of the two sources, there's that is the perfect model where our data fits the line identically with no, no error. The worst case model is we've got no ability to predict. So our regression sum of squares is zero. Our residuals is everything. That's just some large number. And then the total sum of squares is also some large number. So we first took that. That model was to set a straight line where the line acts prediction is simply the average, which also happens to be our uh, single parameter we estimate to be zero. So we have a data by above and below that line, so that the average of the y is y bar without estimation. So those are our two screen cases. So every regression model we work with in the future will be somewhere in between those two. Now we also say that this perfect model had r squared equal to 1, and this worst case had r squared equal to 0. You recall that that r squared, we said, was equal to the regression sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. Now, another way we can write that, of course, is to say the regression sum of squares is equal to the total sum of squares minus the residual sum of squares divided by the there's another way of expressing R squared. Recognize that the total sum of squares adds up to these two entries individually, regression plus residuals, gives me the total. So I can simply write regression there as the difference between the total sum of squares by the start off with minus with what I'm left over the residuals. That RSS is going to be the key focus of today's class. Understand what RSS is. That's why I want to write it in that form. We're going to use this in a minute, and I'm going to show you an interesting relationship between R squared and standard error using that. So before we get to that point, uh, as I said, the one thing that we want to touch on is the degrees of freedom. And this might help you understand what the degrees of freedom mean from a statistical point of view. So let's take a look here. We've got n data points on which we're going to build our regression model. So if I take my total data set, there's n data points. That's how many I have to start with. Now, I can use those data points to fit my model. And what I'm saying up here is that to fit my regression model, I'm going to use k reading k. Lower case k. And as a result, the remaining degrees of freedom are into the residuals, n minus k. Now, k, lowercase k is equal to 2. It's equal to 2 because we're putting one parameter for the intercept and a second parameter for the slope. So we can assume or use 2 degrees of freedom because for our case, one parameter for the slope, one parameter for the intercept. Understand where this comes from. If you have two data points, can you put a least squares model? You've got one x value and a y value, and then you've got another x and y value. Can you fill a least squares one with those data points? Yeah. It would be a perfect model, exactly. So two data points, 
There's one data point, there's another data point on your x and y axis. It's a perfect model because that model will pass through the two data points exactly with no residual error. That's the key point. There will be no residuals on that model. Can you fit the regression model with three data points? Yeah. So if I add a third data point, that data point might be over there. And then that regression model has how many degrees of freedom? One degree of freedom. Okay. We've used two degrees of freedom to find the slope and intercept. There's one degree of freedom remaining. So we've got a little bit of wiggle room. That slope and intercept can be adjusted. We've got a few different options to fit that slope and intercept. I've got one degree of freedom. Okay, so two degrees of freedom, sorry, uh, two data points are the minimum number of data points to fit the slope and intercept. What sort of regression model can you fit with one data point? Plus an error. 
if they normally distribute. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that now. That residual distance, or that standard deviation, is the sigma of this distribution. That sigma, in other words, that bear, that standard deviation, is the standard error. So if my residuals, and there's the key, key word, if my residuals are normally distributed, the standard error represents standard deviation of that distribution. Okay, so residuals being normally distributed, easy, easy check. You can put that into R and plot. So I can easily verify whether my residuals EI are normally distributed. Once I know that they're normally distributed, I can go calculate the standard deviation of those residuals that gets me SE. And then the interpretation I have is SE is that standard deviation of the normal distribution. So what is a lower bound and an upper bound that will contain 95% of all my residuals? So how far do I go on this axis and how far along up do I go? How far down do I go before I've got bounds that contain 95% of my residuals? Two standard errors each way. So go down to minus two times the standard error and plus two times the standard error. And those bounds will contain 95% of my residuals. So we're going to start to see then that the standard error is a far more useful way of interpreting our models, prediction ability. Because what does a good model have for standard error? What's a good standard error going to be? This is a bit of a misleading question intentionally. What's a characteristic of the standard error for a good model? Small numbers. Okay. We want small numbers for our standard error for a good model. Large numbers imply large residuals. Okay. So large residuals means your distribution is wide. Smaller residuals imply your distribution is narrow. Okay. And distribution will always be centered at zero. Now the one other point I do want to emphasize is Take a look at this definition for standard error. We say there that that's RSS divided by n minus k. Now, we can do the following. Based on what we know from r squared, we said earlier, I said the following class, we can write r squared as TSS minus RSS divided by TSS. So, Take your regression sum of squares divided by total sum of squares, that's r squared. So what you can do is you can rearrange this formula then and write that as RSS, the residual sum of squares, is equal to TSS times 1 minus r squared. A high R squared 
who you know is desirable. What does that imply then? The standard error. The small standard error. Okay. So you get an immediate link here between what R squared does over to standard error. Okay, so it just emphasizes that, that knowledge that you're already comfortable. The reason why I want you to start to move away from R squared is because no models get built once. You build one model, then you build a second model, and then a third model. So how do you judge that improvement in R squared as you build successive models? So for example, your model that goes from 50% R squared to 60% R squared. How do you judge what that's done for your predictions? There's no way, because R squared is this number that's related to the correlation between x and y. So there's no way of telling what that's done in terms of improvement. But over here, this will tell you, if you're using the standard error, the standard error would have gone down from one model to the next. That standard error is actually quite interpretable. Because it's the, the histogram of the residuals, a new model with a smaller standard error implies that your error has come down. And we're also going to see in the next few classes and so in the next few slides that when you predict y, one of the main things you want from a model is to get a prediction of y. But you also want error bounds. You want plus or minus error bounds. Those error bounds are going to be related to the standard error. So the smaller your standard error, the smaller your predictions of y has in the future. Right, if you have a perfect model, you'll have all your residuals equal to zero, so that histogram essentially comes to Okay, so that's just a little bit of background related to the standard error. That's all here in these slides. You don't need to go through that at the same time. Um, that covers pretty much all that material. And we can now move on to our next part, our next goal of trying to calculate confidence intervals for E0 and E1. So allow me just to quickly show what, what I'm, where I'm going with this. And let's also recall what confidence intervals mean. title of that slide is totally incorrect. That should be confidence intervals for beta 0 and beta 1 because recall the confidence interval is never for a statistic, it's always it's never for a statistic for a parameter. Confidence intervals are for beta 0 and beta 1. You want to find lower bounds and upper bounds for them. So I'm just going to do this for beta 1. If we do it for one of them, we can do it for the other. So the intention is the same. And remember, a confidence interval for beta 1 comes from creating a z value. So let's go a little bit further back in time in the slides where we said that if we want to estimate the confidence interval for a parameter, we need an estimate of that parameter. So my estimate of beta 1 is t1. divided by the expected value for the parameter, divided through by the standard deviation. Well, I don't know the standard deviation, so I'm just going to call this the variance of beta 1. Take the square root. So all I've written over there is the z value. If I knew the true population value for beta 1, and if I knew the variance of beta 1, I could say then that that falls below some cn value there and some minus cn value. So upper and lower critical bounds for that z value. Now I don't know the variance of beta 1. I need a standard deviation to get the mean on there. Remember, this is the population standard deviation. If we don't know the standard deviation of that number, 
So we're going to estimate it, and that is fairly detailed. And when, the moment we go to an estimation of it, then my upper and lower bounds change to the critical values for the T distribution with a certain number of degrees of freedom, which is why we spoke about degrees of freedom earlier on. So our whole goal here is really to set up this confidence interval and then find lower and upper bounds for beta 1. And we can repeat that same exercise for the confidence interval for beta 0. So please change that slide's title, confidence intervals for beta 0 and beta 1, because confidence intervals are always for the parameter. Now, I could jump ahead and show you the results of what the confidence interval is, and perhaps let's do that quickly. If you go forward the several slides in your notes, that confidence interval is derived, and I put it over there, and then I do some calculations, and it looks pretty messy. The software will do this all for us. But before we get to that point, we have to make some strong assumptions. And that's what I'm quickly going to discuss. So in order to make the, that confidence bound, several things have to be true. And these are mostly true in our situations, but very often we violate them. And if we violate them, that also means our confidence bounds are not going to be accurate. So these are some standard assumptions. The first one is that the model structure that we selected is correct. So we selected that our model is some intercept beta 0 plus some slope beta 1 x. But what if my model structure was instead beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 x squared? If that's the true model, so many systems we know in chemical engineering are quadratic in nature. So for example, the distillation column of vapor liquid equilibrium might be more accurately described by a quadratic model. If you've forgotten the quadratic term or incorrectly specified this model, that quadratic term, beta 2 times x squared, that should have been there, that term is going to get sucked up into the residuals. And because you've, not, you've forgotten to specify it, so it's going to fall away and go into the residuals. So the first assumption we're interpreting on the squared model is that the model I've chosen is actually the correct one for this linear model that you see out here. So if that assumption is true, this next point falls into place, and that's that the residuals are related to y. So let's just talk about this one final time. Let's say that that's my model that I've selected. And let's also say that that model is true. So I haven't made a mistake. That means that these residuals that get tacked on to the end there are the residuals related to y. Because this is true, beta 0 is a fixed number, beta 1 is fixed, and shortly I'm also going to tell you that x is fixed. So those three values are fixed. So there, those residuals are residuals related to y. temperature, y is vapor pressure. If you keep your distillation column at the same temperature, 
and you go measure vapor pressure repeatedly at that temperature, you're going to get a distribution of Y values. And you'll never, when you repeat that, that sample, you'll never get the same value the second time you get the distribution of values set up. If I move to some lower temperature and I repeat that process, I get another distribution of vapor pressure values. What this assumption is saying is that no matter where you are along the x-axis, the spread in that distribution is always the same amount. Okay, so it says that your variance of y at all other at all levels of x, no matter where you are along the x-axis, that variance in the y is the same. So all those new histograms have the same spread, the same standard deviation. So we call that the constant error variance assumption. Why error? The answer is here. It's the constant error variance assumption because the variance of y is equal to the variance of the errors. And that's true because beta 0, beta 1, and x are fixed. So whatever this variance is in y, it's also the variance of the errors. So we turn that, we call that the constant error variance assumption. Now, in practice, this, is, this assumption is violated. You can imagine um, the distillation column, if you go to higher and higher temperatures, the variability in your measurement increases. So it's very often that as x increases, our variance also increases. But the key assumption of each is that it's constant. This is also a tough assumption to check because it requires lots of measurement data. The next assumption is we're going to assume our residuals are normally distributed. Actually, not really assume that till now. But if you want to go and create confidence intervals, this is an assumption we must make. Our residuals have normal, normal distribution. So they, our residuals are normally distributed with mean of zero and some variance. Okay, and again, it's easy to check. We can check normally distributed values from the key. So go ahead, and these data, if you plot this in your lab report right now, you might think these are actually pretty good data, right? There's your regression line. But if you plot those residuals and do a cubic plot on them, you actually notice there's strong non-linearity, sorry, strong non-normality in those residuals. There's a strong tail over there and a few other lines. So these residuals are not going to be The next thing that will also assume is that each error is independent of the other. So if error one in the first data point is independent of the error from the next data point. And again, this is often violated on slow moving processes. Uh, so if you take a sample, sample is here in time, there's y, and you fit your regression model, y against x. If you plot your residuals in time order, you'll see that the residuals are correlated in time. Each residuals are not independent. One residual here is negative, the next residual is also negative, and so forth. If the solution of error is not normal, is it normal? We'll talk about it. It's implying that your model might not be the correct specification. So, what we're going to do is we're going to put out our base assumptions first, then we're going to start looking at when these assumptions are violated, what can we do about it. Because we always want to try and make these assumptions more act, as accurate as we possibly can. The next assumption is that we assume our x's are fixed. Okay, so that's related to specifying that our model is true and linear. Also requires us to say, hang on, these x's here are fixed. What that means is that when you measure x over here, Create your data set, you've got a column of x and a column of y, it's indicating that that column of x has no measurement error in it. But again, that's not true in any case of engineering. Both our x and both our y have errors. And then the last assumption is we have also assume all our y's are independent of each other. So that's also true if, based on the prior assumption, if my x's are, are constant, then the residuals 
the residuals are independent, then the wires will be independent. Uh, yeah, it's very confusing. There's a, there's a subtle difference. Assumption 5 is required before assumption. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I do want to put it out there that both assumptions are required. And if you work through both the, the, the derivation then, it's messy. And I really, I, that's my goal in this course is not to overload us with equations that are, are meaningless. But if you work through the, the messy algebra, we can then construct and calculate what we're really after, and that's the variance all the parameters. So there's a variance of beta 0 and a variance of beta 1. The reason why I say that's messy is you can just, from your, your knowledge of 2i course, your measurements course, and uh, propagation of errors, recall, let's just take a look at one example. We said that b0 is equal to y bar minus b1 x bar. Okay. So if we wanted to calculate the variance of b0, I'll just do the start of the derivation. Well, that's the variance then of y bar minus b1 x bar. And now you can see where this is going. There's three terms in here. All of them are variable. y bar has a variance, b1 has a variance, and x bar has a variance. In fact, the variance of B1 is the variance of an extremely messy term. Okay, it's that whole covariance term that we saw earlier. So if you go back a few slides, go right back, what I need to substitute in that bracket over there is this whole thing. Okay? And I need to calculate the variance of that. Once I have the variance of E1, I can sub it over there, and then the errors propagate. So there's no point in going through all this algebraic derivation in this course. There's no, we don't learn anything from it by doing that. So we'll simply use the result that those variances of E0 and E1 are given in as the slides. And what they're given as is the variance of E1 is related to the standard error. And that's why the standard error is so good in the So let's pause at this point and understand what we've, what we've said over there. We've got the standard error term that I derived for you earlier. And I told you the standard error is related to the variance of the residuals. So there it is. It's the variance of the residuals. If I sum in that variance term, it says take your residuals, square them, by the reason three n minus k. We've already said that we want models with small standard errors. The next thing I'm asking you to believe, but you can derive it for yourself if you like, is the variance of E1 is equal to that standard error divided through by this denominator. Let's take a look at this denominator here right before we move away from it. It says take your x data points minus the mean, square them, and sum them up. All that that denominator is, it's the variance of your x, your raw data x. So let's take a, a second here. Do we want this variance for we want to be large or small? Small. Okay, we want it to be small because it's going to play into our confidence interval. So let's take a look at that. Let's, let me just introduce some other notation here. The variance of V1, we're going to give it a, a new name, standard error for V1 squared. So, unfortunately, this part of the course is a bit like that. We're introducing lots of notation for convenience. So we'll, we'll call the standard error associated with B1. So standard errors, if we square them, they become variances. So now we get a variance for B1. So 
if we have a small variance for E1, it's telling me my confidence intervals up and down, and then here my confidence intervals lower down will be pulled closer and closer. And that's desirable. We want small confidence intervals for parameters in general. And this is why we cover confidence intervals first, so we can get totally comfortable with this idea that narrow confidence intervals are desirable. So now that we know that, we want smaller values for that standard error. So let's take a look back here at this formula on slide 56. Back to the variance formula for V1. We said that that's equal to the standard error from the model divided by x minus x bar squared. I just want to talk about that denominator because this is a good way that you can tweak your models to get small standard small confidence intervals. The way you can do that is you obviously want that denominator to be large. And so you get smaller variances if you have a large denominator. And what that denominator is telling you is that if you use data, xj, that's far away from the sample mean, you'll get better estimates of the stock. So let's take a look at why it is geometrically. There is algebraically, and a lot of you kind of find that unintuitive. So let's take a look at that graphic. It says that if you want good estimates of your slope, you should sample your x data broadly from a very wide range far away from x bar. So if here's x bar, and there's my initial model perhaps. So I'm going to get some estimate of slope. It says that you can get a better estimate of the slope if you sample broadly. So put some data points further and further away from x bar and you'll get a better estimate of the slope. And that's intuitive because if your data span a wide range, you are broadening the range over which that slope is calculated. If you sample your data over a narrow range, I sample my data from a narrow range, I may have those six data points. And that slope could have been there, could have been there, could have been there. I could have had any number of slopes. So I would get, what that means is I would get wide confidence into this. The moment I put my data points further away, simply just adding two or three data points that are further away means that my estimate of the slope will get more accurate because there's far less movement to estimate the slope. So it's a bit of a geometric viewpoint of what that algebraic effect is. Okay, so most people's eyes are glazed over by all this math. That everyone's also wanting to go enjoy the rest of the evening. Let's perhaps kick off the last few minutes with just an interesting case study that helps to put this in perspective. So I'll just jump over a few slides, we'll come back to the details next class. But I do want to just talk about this example as a nice way to end all our understanding. So this data set talks about a regression model that looks at the number of people who die on the roads on the vertical axis, so that's deaths, and on the horizontal axis is traffic cameras. So number of traffic cameras, zero up to 15, so there we see the UK, Netherlands, Israel, they have many cameras. Canada is, in fact, one of the lowest dead points. We have almost no traffic cameras. Now these are deaths, many in Russia, Ukraine, Serbia, China, and Croatia. Does that model, does it look like a least squares model that is supported by this data? A linear regression model. Okay, everyone pretty much says no. Why is that? The curvature. Okay, so a better model might be more something along those lines because of the non linear survey. Well, let's see if the software shows that to us. The software, if you fit a regression model, we get a slope 
at an intercept, and the slope has a confidence interval of minus 1.8 to plus 0.4. What's that confidence interval telling us? Thank you. 